is this? Is that okay? You can do if you want to. I'll do this here. Uh, hello, EMF 2024. Oh, God. <laughs> planning has already begun. Hello, EMF, and welcome to the beginning of the end of this one. Planning for the next one begins, of course, tomorrow. Um, a lot of people have, from a lot of teams, have done a lot of work over the last few months to make this event happen. A lot of it, hopefully, was invisible. Um, so we're going to have a whistle-stop tour through the various teams that have been involved in this event. Not all of them, I'm afraid, just the ones I managed to collar in the bar last night. Um, and we'll begin with the, with the site where everything always starts. Russ. Yes, hello. Um, this is going to be a bit PowerPoint karaoke because I haven't really gone through these slides in any detail. And I didn't write any of them. People have just done them for me. So, um, yes, we got here Wednesday of last week. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday of last week. Um, and... Uh, and got into the field and just plugged the internet in, which is quite easy this time. And uh, this is kind of the state of our storage unit before the event. You'll, you'll see that uh, it's very tidy and it won't be like that by the end of next week. Um, we had some vehicles. We had some vehicles that broke, as they tend to do. We had some more vehicles. These also broke, because as they tend to do. But they are all still just about drivable. Um, we have a shit truck, um, which is great, actually. I, I really like it. The amount of time you spend running a festival is mostly dealing with fluids of some sort or another. And, um, and uh, we produce a lot of wastewater because you all like showers, which I find a bit weird. Just get rid of that spider. Um, Fluids, more fluids. We had, we had a really quite significantly increased plumbing operation this time, um, including some tremendous artwork from Ben here, um, installation plumbing. Um, we had a shower on top of a tank. That's our crew shower, which uh, we were using for build-up. And, um, oh, hang on, yeah. So we did put a lot of, we, we bought a lot of plumbing fittings. Hopefully we can return some of them. Um, we, there was like a thousand pound screw fix order because we we're like, how many pipes do we need? I don't know. Just, just, just stick a load on screw fix. Um, lots of lighting. 1.2 kilometers of this festoon lighting, which is important to, so you can see where you're going and not trip over things. We got these radios, um, which were quite nice. Um, we, got, we got upgraded. I think we got upgraded because I told the guy who was hiring them to us that we're all nerds. And, um, and they were like, oh, we've sent you all of the nice radios. And I'm like, oh, shit, well, hopefully we don't lose any then. Um, we got a battery-backed up repeater, which actually proved useful when the power failed yesterday. Um, that was on the grid power. It was like, oh, the grid power's not going to fail, but we might as well get a battery on there anyway. Um, which was good. Um, we had a significantly increased gas set up this time for the volunteer catering, which we were like, oh, we'll sort that out. And then a couple of weeks ago, we were like, oh, we're not going to be able to sort that out ourselves. So we had like one inch gas pipe and all sorts of nonsense installed by a supplier. Um, I think they have to come and uninstall it as well. We had a lot of construction stuff, which you may have seen around, the, the kind of boring stuff like sinks and worktops and things. Again, this is this is something that we were like, oh, we'll just finesse it while we're on site. And then it's like, oh, we need quite a lot of wood and things and post boxes and sinks. And I don't even know what else. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> signage. Um, we, we have to pay for signage because the council likes us too. So you, you will pr probably have seen those signs on the way in. Um, we changed them a little bit over last time because last time it said Eastner Castle and the castle got a lot of visitors. So um, we, uh, we, th there's, there's, a, there's a bit of art, an art to all of this, which we uh, are still learning, it turns out. Steam Festival. Steam Festival, oh, Jesus. There was, a steam, there was a steam festival last weekend and, and they were not very good at finding the right entrance and a lot of them came in here and they're like, is this the steam festival? And I'm like, does it look like a steam festival? <laughs> it's the complete opposite of a steam festival. I didn't go to the steam festival, I think Mark did. 
It was good, apparently. You should go next year. Um, power, which I'm also doing. This was our power plan for this year. You're not expected to read that. Um, we have slightly improved, I wanted to improve it further, but I didn't have enough time, the, uh, the computational power planning software from last time, so that pre-calculates all of the stuff and tells me whether either the cables are too long or, you know, the breakers won't be able to trip in time and stuff like that. Um, that's all kind of printed out and uh, then Matt laminates it all and um, scribbles on it. And, uh, and, well, basically what happens is our power supplier sends us a slightly different set of stuff from what I planned for. And, um, and then we have to spend our ages working out if we've got enough sockets for everything. So that was last Saturday or something. We also had two power deliveries this time. We got some build-up power with this um, fetching pink generator, which broke. And um, <laughs> twice. And, uh, and, um, and some other stuff, some diesel. De this, this is the fluids again. Oh, God, there's another spider. Um, I didn't know what you were talking about with all these spiders. That's the third one. Um, and uh, yeah, so we got that, that, that arrived last Wednesday and uh, gave us enough stuff to run our heated blankets and so on, the important stuff. Um, and and uh, we also got this hybrid power box, which you may have seen on, uh, kind of beautifully displayed along the trackway down there, um, which we got primarily because we need a backup power source for the festoon site lighting. But uh, we also used it for build-up, so we could turn the generator and have a, turn the generator off and have a nice quiet night. Um, it also runs Python, it turns out. Um, <laughs> didn't do a huge amount of hacking on that one because it's not being used for much in, during the actual event. It, it, maybe it saved us a little bit of diesel as well, because it's more. If, the generators are quite inefficient when you run them at a low load. So um, if you can do it off the battery instead, that's more efficient in theory. But that's the start of our like battery power and renew more, slightly more renewable things. We'd love to get into not burning so much diesel, but uh, especially given the prices have gone up substantially this year uh, for various reasons. Um, but uh, it's hard to get power in the field, it turns out. And uh, diesel is quite an efficient, efficient way of bringing it. And then our main power turned up a few days later on this enormous, not a high ab um, thing. Uh, we, we, we're a big fan of this truck. It has visited our, our events several times before, and um, it can lift generators an implausibly long distance. Um, that's where we put the, uh, you will, you will probably have seen the, the hybrid power thing during the event, and that is just basically a big UPS. Um, it's even lead acid, it's not even lithium. Um, and then we did an increased amount of testing this year, thanks to all the power team who went to a, a huge amount of work to get basically more tests than we needed. We have so much data on this now, which we probably won't do anything with, but um, we have 30-odd thir pages of ele electrical completion certificates. Um, These slides are in a slightly random order, so please forgive me if I'm not. Yeah, so in 2016, we had a bit of a fuel shortage. Um, the photo on the left there is the first outing of this. It's now, it's now past the statute of limitations on this photo. Um, this is Benny draining some red diesel from the telehandler to put in the generator, because we ran that low. Um, 2018, we were okay for fuel, although the tanks unexpectedly arrived empty when we thought, we thought they were going to be delivered full, so that wasn't terribly handy. This year, uh, well, um, we bought a lot of diesel, basically. We increased the, the, we, we've increased the length of the event by the day. We've increased the build-up. That means we have to turn the generators on earlier. We've got one more generator than we had previously. We've got four grids on site this time, um, and that means that we have more generators running at lower load, drinking more fuel. It's about 300 quid's worth of diesel a day just to run the, those generators at idle. Um, and uh, so that was the fuel delivery of 6,000 litres. That was about, and then we got another 4,000. So um, there's about 16,000 pounds worth of diesel, I think, including that. Um, 
because we pay road prices for it now, thanks to, um, thanks to the government very kindly changing the law while diesel prices were going up. Um, so I think we're good. The power hasn't gone out yet. I, I think we, we, we rather overestimated the, uh, the amount of diesel we'd need to run the generators. So we, we didn't end up with a diesel shortage, but we did end up with a lot of time faffing about with spreadsheets and trying to work out whether we would have a diesel shortage, um, which is surprisingly hard. We broke a few generators, or rather they broke themselves. Um, the fetching pink one uh, broke while I was having a shower. Um, and uh, then when we turned it on again, it would not sustain the correct voltage. So yeah, that's going back. Hopefully we'll get a, new, a replacement tomorrow because we'll need it. And then the other one, the alternator cable fell off, which was not terribly useful. A lot of RCD programming. This is me lying in the field trying to program an impenetrably user interface. It's just horrible. Um, we had a lot of trips of these for some reason this year, which we'd not had in the past, especially given that we were more fastidious in setting them up correctly this time. But, you know, that's why null sector went dead a few times. Hopefully it will not anymore, touch wood. Um, and we did a lot of earth testing, including of a tent peg. I can tell you that a single tent peg is not an acceptable source of earth. <laughs> 580 ohms, not good enough. Has to be below 200. And finally, we got power monitoring working. Last seen, I believe, in 2016, which I was doing through RS-485. But this time, we kind of had the tacit approval of our supplier to reprogram the controllers to enable DHCP and, uh, and plug them into the internet. Well, not directly into the internet, obviously. Um, so we, all of that is on dashboard.emf.camp. And uh, I will have to save it so that we know how much fuel these generators drink when they're on certain amounts of load. Least used power distribution box, nothing plugged in. Most used, <laughs> quite a lot of things plugged in. Thank you for using 16 amp plugs, we prefer them. Um, and uh, if you haven't, then just chop, the end of a, chop, chop a meter off the end of your 13 amp cable reel and wire a plug and a socket on there and then you can use it as both. That stands for itself. <laughs> That's, that, do not do that. I don't know who did that or where they did that, but don't. I think that's actually shorted out, that fuse. I can't tell. Uh, no, not good, not good at all. Um, CO2 monitoring, we also had for the first time this year, thanks to um, Graham, who is also known for the lasers at Null Sector. Um, we unfortunately, uh, so we've, we've been looking at this from a COVID safety perspective, trying to keep CO2 below 600 ppm means there's less li chance of uh, COVID transmission. That was true in pretty much all the stages most of the time, as far as I can tell. Uh, we don't have data for stage B, as far as I know, so maybe that one was a bit marginal, but the rest, the high lines on there are null sector, and unfortunately we only just realized that these NDIR-based CO2 sensors are triggered by stage smoke. <laughs> so those numbers are a bit useless, but at least we know that it's below that level. <laughs> and now the lighting team. Yes, an enormous amount of reading of regulations and design and testing goes into the power network, um, far more than you would expect. And the thing to remember is if your power goes off in the drizzle late at night, it's not a failure of the power system. That is working as intended to keep you safe and alive. Um, so uh, Laurie will uh, talk now about the lighting that he's been doing. So, hi everybody. Uh, on top of all the power stuff, there's a lot of us that now do site lighting as a separate team. So that means we have our own budget and we've managed to pull off a few bigger projects this year. So the, one of the ones you've probably seen are the tent markers or pole toppers around the site. And they light up this year rather than just stuffing festoon in the top of it, on top of a ladder, on top of a gator, on top of some rather dodgy ground. 
Uh, so it's a load of LED strip, some ESP, and a load of Python. Uh, put it all together, and we get some nice color things that hopefully in the future we can reuse again for multiple uh, events. Uh, of course, it goes into a lovely dashboard, as everyone does, with a nice bit of Python. Uh, in future, we should be able to have synchronized lighting across the site as well. It runs on ArtNet, as well as just being separately configurable, which is what we used this year, as we did run out of time a little bit. And the other big thing that we got working last night is the hillside balls. Uh, if you might have seen on the hillside over on that side, last night, big RGB, uh, RGBW, uh, festoon array, uh, full of these small little balls that we uh, ordered lovely from China. Renting would have been uh, man, man, many more times more expensive than just simply buying them. So we now have them, and they look great. Uh, however, I don't have any pictures of them yet because I only finished getting them done last night, so please take pictures tonight. Uh, here it is testing, and it runs on a point-to-point -point link from the hillside over to here. Artnet again, we seem to love that sort of stuff. So if you have any content as well, we, we're a little bit low. Uh, it's 60 pixels by 19 pixels, so not the biggest thing in the world. Uh, send me a message on IRC or try and find someone like me in the site power team, and we might be able to get it on the site this evening. <laughs> no. No. Speaking of that, networking. <laughs> Uh, I also am not entirely sure what order these slides are in now. This has been uh, <laughs> quite a few people editing this simultaneously. Um, but uh, yes, a little bit about the network. Uh, those of you who came to 2018 will remember we put in a street cabinet down, uh, down at the main road where our internet connection is terminated, uh, and then a whole load of fiber all the way up here. This is what that looks like inside. That's our circuit and uh, mostly test devices because the fiber uh, is then patched in on the right there and comes through the ducts all the way up to the site. To this, uh, we found that we'd left ourselves a little note from 2018 that didn't quite work as expected. <laughs> Uh, but that was really handy for early build-up because uh, this was day minus eight, I believe, um, the, uh, the splice chamber there coming out of the manhole and providing immediate internet access, um, well, after Matt had done a little bit of fiddling. It looked a little bit like that with slightly less lightning than we were led to believe from the diagram that Will provided. <laughs> um, so we now have... Uh, Thanks to uh, some energetic rodding in the first week, <laughs> we now have fiber all the way to the very end of the site, and um, we also have ropes pulled down all the way to null sector. Should we choose to use this site again into years time, the fiber will hopefully all be there waiting for us as it was this time. Uh, this is what the network looks like physically. Um, you will see uh, a lot of things that you can't read. Um, we, <laughs> uh, we like to patch wherever possible, patch our fibers passively so that no single DK is a point of failure if there's a power outage in an area. So when we look at the logical diagram here, which is even harder to read, you can see almost everything is connected back to the core switch um, and only a few things are mostly copper downlinked. Uh, and mostly within very short ranges from their upstream switch. Everything comes back to the NOC DC, as we call it. Uh, thank you to the construction team for building us this, uh, this flap in our uh, air conditioning hole uh, to keep all our cables nice and dry. Uh, onto this table, uh, we have two splice closures in there now, one uh, from last time and a new one from this time. That's the new fiber that goes all the way to the end. Uh, and they're patched from there into our core switch which is the bottom one, not the micro tick at the top. <laughs> uh, that's a general overview. We've got our servers down in the bottom left, um, our UPS is in the bottom right, uh, some POC stuff above it, some servers there, and yes, the, the, the not quite load-bearing table, uh, mostly for the relatively light switches and all the fibers. This is a manhole. This is the one down by Null Sector, which uh, is uh, a new one that we've run fiber to this year uh, after removing many, many ants. <laughs> uh, here's a typical DK. So these are the locked 
portable toilets that you'll find around site. Um, this is what they look like inside. Uh, this one is by an underground manhole, so you can see the other end of one of those splice closures uh, sitting on the reel there. Um, and below it, a reel of fiber going to another DK nearby. Um, I think probably half of our DKs now are served uh, underground, and the rest are uh, on grass or running along festoon. Um, yes, and each one has a little switch, and many, many of these were constructed. These go on top of the DK uh, the wireless access point, the ohm light, which up until this event was a very useful measure of whether the network was working in a given area. We did actually have one stuck in the DK down by null sector, which many people decided to report to us. Uh, so we had a little bit of change in our automation this time. Uh, for many years, we've been using a mammoth Google spreadsheet, um, which uh, was, for a time, a reasonable solution. It, it, everything was driven from that. We decided this was the year we're going to switch to using Netbox. Um, Netbox, we didn't have too many custom fields. Most of it is stock Netbox, but anyone who's used Netbox will know getting a large amount of data into Netbox is very tedious. So we did have a smaller spreadsheet driving it. Um, I think we used about four or five sheets from that. Um, but then once everything was in Netbox, we ran that once to import it into Netbox. Um, and then that drove everything. It drove the provisioning, the DNS, uh, the switches, um, the DNS servers, and also the monitoring systems as well. Um, and once it had run, of course, we could update Netbox if there was a last minute request and uh, everything would filter downstream. So these are the two main spreadsheets that we use. Um, this is all the switches and where they're assigned to, which switches they are, how many ports are needed on each of the private VLANs. Um, and this is the other main one, which is our master addressing plan, which again creates prefixes in Netbox. I don't know if this will play. There we go. This is running at 30 times speed, so it takes a full 15 minutes to generate an enormous amount of data in Netbox from, uh, from those two spreadsheets, basically. Um, I don't have anything about, else to say about that, so I'm not going to let it run all the way to the end. And there we go in Netbox, 141 devices. Does it say how many interfaces? Quite a lot, anyway. Uh, feeding things like this is our uh, Isinga NAGVIS map uh, dashboard, which has been sitting up in the NOC looking mostly green all weekend. Uh, and all of, these, all of these tools are in our GitHub account, um, with the exception of Ansible, uh, that we just need to make sure it doesn't have anything, any usernames and passwords in it before we publish that. Uh, that is uh, how much bandwidth we've been using. We had, again, a, a one gig link, uh, thanks to Sky Connect for sponsoring that. Um, it was, uh, it was mostly, mostly okay. Thank you very much for being considerate, um, for the most part. That is a flat line at one gigabit. Um, but again, thank you for stopping when we asked you to stop. And many thanks to the people who emailed in asking to do a thing that would use a lot of bandwidth and didn't when we asked them not to. So thank you for being considerate. Um, no thanks for, for this. This is someone uh, tripping on a fiber and dragging it at least five meters uh, so that all of the slack and the actual fiber was pulled right out of the switch, leaving just the, the connector. This is actually not just a network down issue. This is a, a safety issue because a, a, a very, very thin strand of glass fiber is quite dangerous if you get it in your skin. Um, other than that, the most interesting thing that happened this weekend was uh, a power cut, which didn't really affect the site. Well, it didn't affect the site because we're all on generators, but it did affect the street cabinet. Um, we have a UPS down there, uh, so the circuit from our provider goes into an NTE device, uh, a, a demarcation device, which fortunately has two power supplies, one on the mains, one on the UPS, so we got early notice of this. But it turns out that UPS is a very hard to calibrate if they have 0.0% .0 load, so there was a bit of a panic not knowing how long the power cut was going to last and how long the UPS would last. Um, I think we were probably going to be okay for about three hours, but um, just in case, here's another UPS. Um, and, and, and just in case, here's a, a telehandler bringing a generator down from the site. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, we did actually win, win that race, but only by about five minutes, impressively, uh, according to Western Power's website. Uh, even though it only affected 300 properties, it was back within 45 minutes, we were back within 40. <laughs> not, not bragging. Um, and I'll pass over now to AK to talk a little bit about the Wi-Fi and some of the logistical issues we've had. So um, across the event, we've uh, seen about um, almost 11,000 uh, unique devices on the network, which is about uh, 3.6 device per visitor, assuming around 3,000 visitors. Uh, five and a five and a half thousand devices of those uh, were uh, smart devices, smartphones and uh, tablets and such. Um, 3,100 uh, ESPs, so that's those are the espressive devices, which are uh, this is a chipset is also that's being used in the batch, and around um, 1,800 workstation laptops, etc. And this was on the wireless uh, and the wired network, by the way. Um, for the wireless network, uh, we've seen a peak of about 3,000 Wi-Fi clients. And this was across uh, 97 8211 AC access points uh, from Aruba. And the peak of traffic was around uh, 750 uh, megabits of traffic. Uh, something different of than Wi-Fi is the, uh, the uh, logistical situation we had to go through to get all the equipment from the Netherlands and Germany to um, uh, to the UK, so and that is because of the um, changed regulation situation with the United Kingdom, and because of this, we needed to apply for a um, what what we call an uh, ATA carnet, uh, or this is a sort of passport for goods. Um, so we had to apply this uh, through the. Uh, yeah, local Dutch Chamber of Commerce or Kamer van Koophandel portal. And then once we've got this carnet, we uh, needed to use a, a rather expensive courier um, to get all the equipment uh, into the country. And pallet shipment was not really an option uh, for this uh, because it uh, would probably take too long. Um, so with this uh, Kamer van Koophandel website, we ran into some quirks. So one of them is that we, in the portal, uh, portal we could only um, have a list of 45 lines, but we needed 300. Uh, and then we could maybe group um, yeah, our, the items we had on a part product basis, but then we ran into a limitation where we could have maximum uh, 255 characters of serial numbers in this list. So this was a bit interesting. So after some contact with the uh, camera from Coop Handel, um, we found a workaround, and that was that we could upload some custom PDF um, uh, which in a specific format, and then we just put in a like general number of, uh, we had some telecommunications equipment, so many kilos, so many uh, this value, and then it worked, and they accepted it and shipped the carnet in the same day. So. It, in the end, it worked out fine, but the, yeah, the hurdles we had to jump through are a bit inconvenient, so to say. And we'll pass it on to logistics. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, speaking of logistics, the sheer amount of stuff that has to get here at the right time and get to the right amount of uh, the, the right place on the site uh, and then off again at the end is, is staggering. Um, so I'll hand over now to Pez to talk a little bit, bit about logistics. Hi, I'm Pez, head of our logistics team, a team that consisted of just me on site until one day before build. Please volunteer. 
Uh, it turns out the field starts quite empty. Everything you see around you has been delivered, and most of it has come through the logistics team. All the stuff you've seen on the previous slides, uh, from the, the furniture, the bathrooms, the showers, the big top, the beer, all the plants, uh, the club mate, it has all come through uh, the team, and we've had to position it on site, liaise with all different suppliers, uh, and get things where they needed to be. We've accepted a truly ludicrous amount of deliveries uh, and uh, worked individually with over 75 different suppliers. In the logistics tent, we've had over 400 individual packages come into and out of the tent over the course of the event. And I'm just going to call out some of my personal favorites, which include a 46-parcel Amazon delivery, which went all the way to Null Sector. It was the delivery driver's entire route. He came here, <laughs> dropped off everything, that was it, done. <laughs> Uh, there was an entire Tesco van of milk. For weight limit reasons, they're only allowed to put four bottles of milk in each pallet, so the entire van was just our milk, nothing else. She was also clocking off afterwards. Uh, all of the wood chips you've seen around site, which has been magically appearing wherever mud is, it's not magic, the team helps, but uh, it's been a lot of effort getting that distributed. Uh, and my personal favorite, our firewood supplier who delivered all of our firewood and rang me an hour before he was supposed to deliver everything telling us he'd accidentally set fire to all of his wood and all of his shed. So that was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> but the wood got here, we had wood, it was all fine. Uh, I limited myself to only three slides because I don't want to run over, so passing over to Funds. Yes, it turns out that if your Amazon app is telling you the driver is eight stops away, the other seven stops are actually different teams who've used a slightly different address for the site. <laughs> uh, so we were graced again this year with a marvelous phone network. I hope you all used it. Uh, there was, of course, Dex and uh, SIP, but also an Orga phone system. And here's Sam to talk about that. Thank you. So, yes, uh, my name's Sam. I um, head up the POC phone operations team. Um, so a bit of the, the couple of other guys from Event Phone who've been able to help, they've already headed back to Germany, but um, we had deployed 38 decked antennas. They look much like the wireless access points, but they're a bit flatter and have four LEDs on them. Um, if that's the only real difference you can spot. Uh, we also deployed a 35 SIP phones, so pretty much every tent had a, had a wired SIP phone. Um, I also staged 35 SIP phones in my office at home two weeks ago. <laughs> with a lot of cables. Um, 54 POTS phones, the, the wired uh, dial-up, the old-fashioned kind of, you know, analog uh, twisted pair copper that, that Matthew did. Um, he had those devices. We also had two um, dual-mode GSM LTE cells on site, which you may or may not have noticed, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we also got uh, Wi-Fi calling working, which was a sort of POC knock thing, because phones are just IP these days. Um, but we, we managed to do that Thursday with a bit of hackery. A um, few cool stats, so we had 390 DEC devices on the network, uh, 250 SIP, 54 POTS, um, 16,700 calls internally through the system, which is quite a lot for that, so people, well, some people must have just been sat there, like, yeah, <laughs> dialing with it. Um, we also deployed a, a Jambones server, which is a, like a, your own private programmable Twilio type service, um, so a few people created applications, in total 69 applications on that but half of those were probably my workshop. Um, uh, 846 calls, so some of the, the 555 numbers you saw around, like you could call Matt's booty call app and, and things like that, there were some cards distributed. Um, 555 duck, if you haven't tried it, by the way. <laughs> Just... Uh, this was, yeah, the Wi-Fi calling. Um, so previous years, you may have noticed, Wi-Fi calling didn't work, um, mainly because we have a German IP range, and the UK carriers think you're in Germany and won't let you use Wi-Fi calling when you're abroad. Um, so we tunneled all the traffic for Wi-Fi calling back um, through an L2TP tunnel to my ISP, um, and currently all of your carriers think you're at my house. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, 2,983 uh, unique IP addresses, which I think should be pretty much a unique mobile if they'd attached to the Wi-Fi. Um, 
So that's yeah, the number of phones. Not a lot of traffic though, or in terms of volumes. I mean, it's you know, it's voice calls. It was we were doing well, that's a daily um, 600 megabytes a day transferred over that link, and it was you know a few hundred kilobits a second. Um, but it, it makes it quite useful. Uh, the cellular stats, so the, say the phones that connected, 3,400 odd unique SIM cards connected to our mobile network with that rough breakdown of different carriers. Um, so, yep, uh, 720 calls and over the 4G, about 27 gigabytes up and down of, of data over 4G. Uh, and you may have had an SMS saying you were in Jersey. Um, it's complicated. Um, I can explain it more later if you're interested, but if I'm in the bar. But if you did, if you could forward the message to that number, um, it would really help us to build up a, a record because we can then look to, they're trying to filter those out because you shouldn't get them, but because of the, the hack of the way it works, you do. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have that message, please forward it to that number. We just, we're just logging the content of the text. I'm not even recording your numbers, but we can then build a train a spam filter to block them. And that's me. Thank you. Uh, none of us would be here without a, a ticket. Well, I, I, I hope no one's here without a ticket. Um, <laughs> and here to talk about how the website uh, works and how it has evolved this year uh, is Mark from Team Web. Hi, right, I'll try and keep this brief because there's not that much interesting infrastructure. We try and keep the infrastructure boring. Um, so uh, since 2018, um, we obviously had a massive uh, rush to rework the website to sell t-shirts when the event was cancelled. Um, but since then we've had uh, 1,400 commits, uh, almost 40 different contributors, uh, adding a whole load of extra functionality this year. Um, so I just want to do a quick call out. If, if anyone wants to get involved in the website, just check out our GitHub um, repository and, and have a look and um, you know, on the, on the issues or anything, issue, give us a pull request uh, if you want to be on this, on this list. So thank you to uh, uh, Ro uh, Ian and um, Robert for sorting out the reworking all the volunteering this year, um, John for the schedule rework, John for the stage screens, uh, John for the village workshops, um, John for the attendee content page. <laughs> <laughs> John has done a lot of stuff this year. Um, he's, he, and if anyone's around who, who uh, is happy to uh, do the artwork, he's, he did all the artwork for the interstitial pages on, the, on these screens. But he would rather someone who's confident with art um, could, could do that as well. Uh, the Herald interface from Sam, uh, Wise Payments from Jay, um, and then various people did um, bar training, guidance from the wiki, API documentation. Um, that's all the new stuff this year. Um, learnings from, this, from the last few years. Um, I know far too much about the, the, the inner thoughts of Kenneth Wright now. I don't use Pipen, it's not great. Um, we're trying to get rid of Gulp as well. Um, and, and in fact, it would be nice to get rid of JavaScript, but there's, only lim there's a limit to what we can do there. Um, one of the, it was only a week before the event that we realized that um, the schedule was all showing wrong because um, JavaScript's months are zero, uh, zero based. So we had, the <laughs> we had the event starting in May. Um, uh, do use Docker, we've, we've Dockerized the website. That was another thing John did uh, and it's, it just makes everything much nicer. Uh, and also staging ticket sales this year. Although the website can cope with very fast ticket sales, it's not fun for anyone. So we've been focusing on a, a voucher system and that just works much nicer and it's fairer. Um, it would be nice to also stage arrivals. Oh, sorry, here, yeah, this is, this is the tickets, ticket sales. You can see them mostly sort of um, creeping up with a few, a few sort of initial tranches where people sort of panicked and bought them in a rush, but actually most of the time that's not necessary. Um, in contrast, this is, this is the arrivals um, on Thursday. Um, the, the peak is due to train delays and then everybody getting on a bus. And you can actually see the, the train arrivals. Um, if, if people could just sort of arrive at different times, that would be great. Just to spread out the load for the arrivals team, that would be, that's, that'd be lovely. Um, 
This is the combination of all the different um, proposal uh, content that people have proposed. So, so starting off with the call for participation, but the massive ramp up at the end is people adding their own stuff on site, um, which is great to see. We had 561 proposals uh, in total and uh, over a thousand messages sent using the messaging system. Uh, and then, just because you have to have graphs for this kind of stuff, you can see the um, traffic to the website during the event, um, showing that people check the schedule at about 8 in the morning and then sort of tail off and go to sleep at about 2. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about, about volunteering um, and how it's evolved over the years. Um, I don't, it sometimes surprises me um, that, people, that people don't know that EMF is entirely not for, not for profit. Uh, any profit that we do make, which uh, is looking increasingly unlikely this year, uh, is plumbed into the, the following event. So everyone here on the Orga team has bought their own ticket. Um, we started in 2012 with 500 people, and our mantra was, everyone is a volunteer. And that worked pretty well. Um, this year we have uh, six times, well, five times as many people checked in, not everyone who bought a ticket checked in. 556 unique people signed up for a volunteer shift. Thank you very much. Um, helping on site is great, we need that. We also need help build up. We will need help next week tearing things down if you can stay a bit longer. Um, I think we're going to say uh, come by the info tent in the morning. Yeah. Um, because there is a lot to do and a lot of people who did the build up are now leaving or have left um, are absolutely exhausted. Uh, we need people to help us roll everything back in again. Uh, equally, uh, if you are interested in planning the event for next time, please get in touch. Uh, a lot of team leads are quite keen to find co-leads or to hand over entirely for the next event, uh, but the time to talk to us about that is not a few weeks before the event. It is many months before the event. Not tomorrow, um, but in a few months. If that's something that interests you, please uh, do get in touch. Um, here is uh, an email address you can use, volunteer at emfcamp.org. Um, if you did do a volunteer shift, you were rewarded with a lovely meal from our volunteer kitchen. I don't know if Joe is here. Joe? Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> behind me. Joe. Hello, hi. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, this year has been the first year that we've had supplier deliveries. Um, we got Booker set up for the first time, which resulted in uh, an interesting, um, interesting situation that you can see on the board there. If you can notice uh, that every one of those items has a one in the quantity column. <laughs> um, so there's an interesting feature on the Booker website uh, where you can create these shopping lists uh, to add to your cart later. If you then remove the contents of the shopping list from the cart, the quantity re resets to zero, which you may not notice when you then add everything to the cart again. We were a little surprised when our delivery on Wednesday had one loaf of bread and one packet of cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> However, we did have some really amazing local suppliers, including Pengethley Farm, who have supplied us with... Oh, 1,500 eggs over the course of the event, <laughs> uh, including 500 of which James from Pengethley drove over in his car on Saturday. We also had uh, PJ Jones, um, who've come over all the way from Wales and seemed really, really interested in the event. It's really lovely to have them. Apparently, they go up at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is even earlier than our breakfast shift. <laughs> um, 800 servings of crumble. I'm told that was very popular. Uh, v, one of our volunteers, made that. Speaking of which, uh, we have so many people to thank. This hasn't quite updated with everybody I put on there. Uh, you might remember Fish. He's the guy in the chef jacket who never seems to sleep or leave the kitchen. Um, he's also kind and considerate despite that. He's left a buffet open all night for the security people. Uh, one of whom came by at four o'clock last night to request uh, some of V's crumble. <laughs> uh, 
I uh, also have to thank Pinglis, who did our breakfast shift last year. P Fish wanted to thank him for being, he says, the other half of his brain. Nicholas, who signed up just to do breakfast, made the mistake of turning up three days early and ended up doing 50% of the kitchen workload until other volunteers showed up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, v, we've already mentioned, V is a dishwasher in a, in a fine dining kitchen in their day job and has been blossoming into a full-time chef, full chef in our kitchen here. Uh, just amazing work. It's delicious food that they've been making. Bryony has her own catering experience, done festival catering them, herself. Um, came by about 9 p.m., volunteered to just do all our washing up, all of it, and then came back the next day and did it again. <laughs> Uh, Gnome and Pescoda, who I'm told were really incredibly valuable for coordinating our angels on shift. Thank you. Natty and Robert, helping with planning all through those months before, you know, where we're trying to get everything going, get all our menus planned, really, really helpful. Um, one final thing I should mention, which I don't have on these slides, which is if you were kind enough to volunteer for our closing shift, between 9 p.m. and midnight, you deserve a special reward. May not have remembered to give it to you. Drop by the kitchen later today. Thank you. Uh, now, I think what's happened here is that I've edited the slides while they were already presenting, and there is now a feature that stops someone doing this, which uh, will prevent surprises like I had last time when Will put in the slide saying uh, many, uh, executive producer David Croft. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here from First Aid who wants to talk about First Aid. Oh, yes. There we go. So we've only got 106 slides to get through um, for the first aid. Um, so we sit at the back, and if you've come and seen us, you, you've probably been, been hurt. But there hasn't been any really serious incidents on site, um, which, which, which is really good. If you've died, put your hand up. I can see no hands because the, the blinding lights, which, which, is, which is good. But in seriousness, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we had some, a lot of issues. Our licence was pending on all of the first aid cover and things like that. We had to make some really rapid change, very, very rapidly, make lots of people disappointed that they weren't going to be able to come to EMF. Um, so thank you for those who could come and attend because their qualifications. So just some statistics. We've had an A&E consultant on site. We've had nurses. We've had three A&E consultants, I'm now told. Three GPs. Uh, three GPs. We've had nurses. We've had minor injury specialists. We've had paramedics. We've had um, everything from freck free up to A&E consultant. So they're keeping you safe. And it's, it's been really good. Some of the low lights, would I say, cool. um, is a lot of the sort of slip strips and falls. Um, that's been our bread and butter, as it were. Um, our most serious incident was someone cut themselves and needed to um, be stitched. So we, we, we were able to do that on site. The whole point that we wanted to do was to stop things going out to hospitals. Um, a lot of, obviously, we, we, we know the NHS is under pressure and we know that there, there's a lot of stress there. We haven't sent a single person off site. They've all been able to be treated here because of the, the people that have helped. So, who here didn't pack appropriately for the British countryside? <laughs> Uh, definitely more, you're all lying. Um, yeah, massive thank you for everybody for being sensible. Um, massive thank you for all our volunteers, for OMS who provided the ambulance next to us, and for Nip About who did all of our safeguarding on site. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for not dying. <laughs> Uh, 
so another thing uh, people often don't realize about EMF is that we deliberately try to keep the ticket price as low as possible to make the event as accessible as possible. Uh, so your ticket pays for the basic infrastructure. It pays for the tents, the toilets, the sanitation, and so on and so forth. And all of the shiny stuff uh, comes from sponsorship and uh, support of, of, uh, of our supporters. I'm very tired. Um, <laughs> Uh, John T, I'm sure, will be thanking the sponsors in his closing presentation, uh, but I want to thank now uh, our supporters who give us things that money just can't buy. Uh, you can't buy an internet connection to a field in Hereford for one week, for example. Uh, we couldn't buy uh, 50 switches um, and put them in the storage unit for two years in between events. So I would just like to say a special thanks to all of these supporters, uh, Sky Connect, Lonap, Event Infra, Sargasso, Pylon One, Mythic Beasts, I3D, Ask For, and Comtech. Thank you very much. <laughs> we would like to do better. Um, I fully accept that the network we built this year is not the one that we would like to have built. Uh, it is, in fact, in a few respects worse than the one we built last time, uh, logistical issues of shipping uh, 50 very heavy switches from the Netherlands meant that we couldn't quite uh, build the network we wanted. We would like to get some of that kit here in the UK. If your company is mothballing um, switches that are more modern than our 2000 era switches that we're currently using in the network. Um, if you are removing servers that you don't need uh, that are more modern than our eight-year-old servers that are currently running in the NOC DC, um, switches with 10 gig or better uplinks, uh, can you help us with the connectivity to the site, which may or may not be here? We don't know yet, but uh, please talk. Uh, knock at emfcamp.org. If you have something to give away and it's useful, we do have storage. We can take it at any time. You don't have to store it for us. We'll take it. We'll arrange someone to come and pick it up, clean it, um, sanitize it, and put it in storage. Um, so please get in touch if you have something to offer. And if you'd like to volunteer for the next event, get in touch, volunteer at emfcamp.org. For everyone who helped build this event, all of my colleagues, all of the volunteers, everyone who came for a setup, everyone who will stay for teardown, many thanks.